Welcome everyone to another episode of Three Plastic Surgeons uh, and a Microphone. As always, I am Sam Dejurikar, joined by my co-host Sam Ree. But unlike always, we are not joined by our third co-host, uh, Dr. Salvatore Pacella. And that's because, um, unlike most times, Dr. Ree and I are actually in the same location. Um, Dr. Ree and I uh, actually just spent the past week in Bangladesh with the charitable organization Smile Bangladesh, which is an organization that is near and dear to our hearts. Uh, Dr. Ree went on the very first Smile Bangladesh mission with the co-host, uh, with the uh, co with the founder, uh, Shahid Aziz, about 16 years ago, and was on the board of directors. About two years into the uh, the uh, organization's inception, he invited me along on a trip, and I've been involved ever since, and I'm now on the board of directors. So uh, it's near and dear to our hearts. But for those of you watching our um, podcast on video, you may notice that we are definitely not in Bangladesh. Um, we are enjoying a little extended layover in uh, a, a place very unlike Bangladesh, Dubai, um, which um, is a beautiful city with a lot to offer. In fact, earlier today, Dr. Ree and I were enjoying afternoon tea. Uh, Sam, you ever had afternoon tea before? Yeah, we just had it a couple of days ago. We were sitting in a hospital in Dhaka in Bangladesh in a tiny room in a hospital eating food that Bangladeshis think American people like, which was basically fried chicken, Coke, and chips. Sitting with Aziz, Dr. Aziz, who uh, is my dear friend, our dear friend. And uh, to me, that that's what afternoon tea is when we travel. <laughs> Yes, for our viewers who don't know what afternoon tea is, it's a very sophisticated British thing with little sandwiches without the crust on on it. But in Bangladesh, it's Kentucky Fried Chicken <laughs> and uh, and tea. Um, but they have a very unique uh, local chicken they use. Um, so, how would you describe the local chicken in Bangladesh? You know, I would say lean would be charitable. <laughs> it's all breading, very little meats, which as a child I would have liked a lot. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so, uh, we're, we're here today to talk about, uh, going to Bangladesh and what it's like to operate there. I, I've done numerous missions to Bangladesh. So, so it's Sam and over the years, one of the questions that always comes up from people is why do you travel all the way across the world to help people with plastic surgery services when there are people in your own country that need help? It's a really good question. And, and I do get asked that. I think the biggest thing to realize is that Bangladesh and the rest of the world is very much unlike the United States. Um, it's, it's a place of unique need. And I know you know the size and scope of the issues faced with a place like Bangladesh. Um, so, so I think from the beginning, let's just talk about demographics. If you talk about demographics, the incidence of cleft lip and palate deformity in Bangladesh um, is um, somewhere between two to four times higher than it is in the United States. Now, couple that with the fact that Bangladesh is the land mass size that's equivalent of about the state of Arkansas. It's about the size of Arkansas. But the population is about half of that of the United States. If you do the math, the density of Bangladesh is about 35 times greater than that of the United States. It's like half the population of the United States crammed into something the size of Arkansas. So for every neighbor you might have, Sam, um, in Bangladesh, someone would have 35 neighbors. Uh, and so it's incredibly dense. Um, the other thing is, you know, as, as Shahid Aziz has told us numerous times, there's very few plastic surgeons and oral surgeons that can actually offer these services. Um, and so it's, it's, it's an abject poverty and an abject need that's on a different magnitude than what we see in the United States. Yeah, the need for uh, for care for cleft um, patients is it's enormous. And when you go to a place like Bangladesh and you see the density, just how crowded it is, how many people there are, just the vast numbers of patients there. I mean, you are a drop in the bucket for sure, but the impact that you feel like you can make where in a week with these children is is unlike what you could what you could do in a, in a place that has way more resources and abilities, such as, such as a place like the United States. So the way our trips are typically structured is we tend to have a team that comes from across the United States. 
Uh, Smile Bangladesh is headquartered in New Jersey, but there's a component from Dallas, which is where, where I'm from. Um, there's a component from the Northeast, which is where Dr. Rhea is from. And on this last trip, we had a team that had 22 people. This consisted of oral surgeons, plastic surgeons, which were me and Sam, um, excellent nurses, an amazing anesthesia crew, um, with four, uh, five anesthesiologists actually. Um, and, um, and an anesthesia tech. So we had a full complement of people from across the United States. Our first, and, um, and there's a few sites now because we've been going for a while to Bangladesh, a few different sites that we actually will go to probably five or six hospitals altogether. But every time you go, you basically go to an OR that's just an empty room. You got OR tables, some anesthesia machines you can use, but we have to bring all of our own equipment. We've got to bring the anesthesia gas. We've got to bring the surgical instruments, the suture material, the gauze, everything. We have to bring all that. And so on the one hand, part of the team is working on getting everything set up. The other part is screening patients. Screening patients is a really um, sort of interesting phenomenon. Sam, like how would you describe screening data to, to our listeners? Well, you know, after all these trips, we've gotten incredibly efficient about it. I love our team. We made this year screening go by well, but as you know, it's, it's literally hundreds of families showing up from great, you know, really far distances because, you know, they have advertised in advance that there is a team coming from the United States to help, um, these specific types of patients. And these families are literally crowding around this hospital at, um, to be evaluated. Yeah, I mean, to, to even talk about it more, imagine sitting at a table um, with you, maybe a, a local physician, an anesthesiologist, and tens and tens up to 100 people crammed into a room. And you've got, uh, you're basically surrounded on all sides of people that want to be seen. There's a language barrier. Um, you're reliant upon other people to translate for you. You might have some labs. Um, but you know, in my impression, and tell me if you agree with this, Sam, the level of deformity of what we see there was unlike what we see in the United States. And a lot of these kids have just so many other congenital problems. Yeah. I mean, I've worked as a craniofacial surgeon in a, in a previous life, and I've never seen the range and rarity of some of these craniofacial and cleft deformities. These are things that typically you might only see in a textbook. Um, and you might see um, these routinely uh, you know, on a screening day. And you, you literally have no information about these patients other than what these families can give you. And they can pretty much give you no information. So you're, you're trying to do diagnose these pretty complex conditions in the space of five minutes, maybe, because you have so many patients to see. You know, anesthesia is trying to determine if they're healthy enough or if it's safe enough to have them uh, withstand surgery. And it's a little stressful to try to figure out what it is that you can do for these patients. Uh, when you know these are the kind of issues that if you were in the United States, we would literally spend months teeing them up in order to take care of them properly. And so I think you got different types of patients that you see. Rarely you see a young child with a relatively straightforward cleft lip or cleft palate, no other problems. Those are the ones that we get, ex you know, can feel really amazing about being able to help because. Uh, we know we can take care of them in a safe manner. And, you know, the first rule of the Hippocratic Oath that all doctors take is to first do no harm. And we know we can, we can do these cases safely. Another category, go, though, can be somewhat heartbreaking. These are either the patients that clearly have medical problems that, are, uh, that would require significant workup that we're just unable to deliver in these situations, or medical problems that are just beyond our scope. Um, Sam, tell them about the, the, the young woman that oh, we God. saw together at our table. This, this was a heartbreaker. She was such a, a beautiful young woman. She had a large vascular malformation, which is basically a large collection of blood vessels that she was born with. Looked like a big, um, spongy, grape-like collection on her lower lip. Um, it was basically filled with the blood vessels. And uh, you might see them in the United States, these type of uh, hemangiomas or vascular malformations. Sometimes they call them stork bites. Um, they're little small ones. Often you might see in, in a child and they usually, um, they might regress and get smaller on their own. But this poor um, girl, she might, maybe she was about six. Um, it just, it covered her entire 
lip and it extended all the way along her jawline, almost back to her ears. And uh, it was really difficult to uh, tell her and her family no. Yeah. Be, and, the, and how would you manage that in the United States if you saw that? Well, we would get vascular imaging. We would see the extent to which uh, the blood vessels that were feeding this, this uh, benign tumor, this, this mass of blood vessels, were they led? We would work with interventional radiology um, specialists who would then block those blood vessels uh, and and um, embolize them, basically. Uh, and then once we reduced the blood supply or cut off the blood supply to these, to these masses, then we could safely surgically remove them without risk of severe blood loss. Right. We would have blood products available, too, because the risk of bleeding is quite high. Meanwhile, in Bangladesh, we don't really even have working basic cautery devices like we would have in any OR, like a breast augmentation or an upper eyelid lift. Um, we don't, we don't even have that in our operating rooms there. And then you have the family really wanting us to do this operation. They dress this young woman up in her finest clothing for the for screening day. She was wearing like a tiara and, and pearls and and, um, and even the local surgeons are trying to get us to, to do something because they don't really quite understand the, or, or, you know, want someone else to try to help this young woman. And so saying no on screening day can be heartbreaking. It was the worst, especially this particular girl. Like I said, she was, she was dressed up. She was so cute. She had these little pearls on her tiara. She was wearing this gorgeous little pink dress because, you know, these families often really dress up these kids because they want them to look good. They want us to do these surgeries. And the families don't really understand that the reasons why we can do surgery on a particular child, all they know is, is they traveled such a long distance is they know their daughter needs help and they look around and they see this child being helped and this, you know, we saying yes to this other child, but for some reason that they can't understand, we're saying no. And, you know, screening day is over. They're still standing out there. They're begging. Probably yeah. one of the tougher times uh, when we're dealing in this type of situation. Yeah, it's it's situations like that. Luckily, are not the norm, but they are heartbreaking for sure. So that day is over. We set up the OR, and then Shahid Aziz, who we've had on a previous podcast. If you're interested in learning more about him and the organization, check out that one. Um, um, but he then compiles his master schedule, and we take in this particular case we had four operating tables going simultaneously. We had an oral maxillofacial surgeon from Houston, Jose Marchena, who uh, works at Bentop Trauma Center. We had Shahid Aziz on another table. We had me on a table. We had Sam on a table. And then uh, we had John Wallace, an oral surgeon from Dallas at another table. You may have noticed that's five and we had four tables. So we have some rotation going on and some relief, but that means we have four anesthesiologists and, and all of this is happening in just sometimes one or two operating rooms when we're doing this. There's a lot of activity, um, lots of, you know, cases going on at the same time, lots of residents uh, in oral maxillofacial surgery from across the country. So it's an amazing experience for these residents because they get to see just the full breadth of cleft lip and palate surgery literally in the span of just a few days. I mean, you got to realize these are exceptionally skilled people who come on these mission trips. Um, shout out to the anesthesia um, providers, Dr. Mike Creaves from Colorado, Dr. Chris uh, Chen from Dartmouth, uh, Dr. Meha Patel, uh, and uh, Zina Hussain. Hussain. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And Zina Hussain. These guys, listen, doing pediatric anesthesia is challenging under any circumstance. You, t you know, it's easier, easier to take care of 150 or you know, hundred pound person, but when you're going with literally four, like a two month old, four pound kid or six pound kid who's malnourished, has a lot of chronic issues. Bangladesh is a really difficult place to grow up and live. These are very unhealthy children. And for them to be able to manage what we do surgically on them, get them through the surgeries, get them to recover, get them to be pain free and comfortable during this. It's, it's a feat that it blows my mind every time I see them do it. We have sort of the simple part of it where we're just doing yeah. what we normally do. Um, but for them, the, the, these are exceptionally different, difficult patients to, to manage.
I always have a hard time putting this next thing into words, but I'm never fully comfortable when I'm in Bangladesh. And I'm not just talking about personal comfort, though that's certainly factoring into it, but even in the operating room setting, um, just all aspects of life, I don't feel that comfortable when I'm there. So do you feel that way? It's a challenge. Listen, you're taking us. We live in the United States. It is comfort. Everything we do is comfortable. And yet, and then you come here. Well, not uh, here. This is very comfortable. Okay, this is very comfortable. To advise, <laughs> but you, you go to Bangladesh and, and you go to some, we actually were in Dhaka this time, which was marginally better. But we've been in places from the minute you step foot into the country where you, where you, where we stay, there are living conditions are, let's just say multiple orders of magnitude different. You're yeah. dealing with potential health issues. Dengue fever was an issue that we were concerned about this time. Yeah. Generally speaking, when we go out um, into the hinterlands and out into the rural areas, malaria prophylaxis is a must. Um, just the, the hospital conditions under which, you know, you have to sort of navigate and, and be creative about in terms of, I mean, these are not OR tables, some of these things. I mean, to this time it was pretty good, but we operate on wood tables, like literal wood tables yeah. we've had we've had operating room lights go out yeah and i remember doing a cleft palette with just my headlights and an uh, and the ambient light of a laptop to to try to be the light um so yeah the, the operating so now i will say that it seems like things are getting better in bangladesh like there's more it, it, it was still not the united states but this most recent trip we actually had real or lights for the first time on any trip um, so it, it is, it is getting better, but yeah, I mean, Sam and I shared a hotel room, a tiny, tiny little hotel room with, we were on these narrow little beds where our beds are basically touching each other. We, um, had a view of, uh, uh, where, where the, the apartment next to ours was about three feet away from our window and it's at the same crumbling <laughs> structure. We could see right into there and it was a, a very nice lady who would look right back at us and she would be doing laundry. Uh, and uh, cooking her dinner all sort of in this tiny little space right across from us. We basically ate curry uh, um, or rice and dal, which is like a vegetable sort of curry for every meal. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner are, are the same are the same meals. I, I think the more I travel and the more we're experienced with this, you focus on the very basics. And the basics are, what can you eat safely? How do you make sure your GI tract is working properly? And how can you not get sick on any of these trips? And I think that we pretty, I mean, as opposed to other trips, we pretty much escaped unscathed this time around. Hopefully. Yeah. I mean, I definitely have my tricks, which are go completely against what I do at home. I only eat highly processed food and I don't drink water <laughs> unless I'm sure it's come from a bottle and I've seen the bottle because Sam and I have both been burned by that in the past for sure. I think the odors and the smells are always interesting when you're traveling around in another country, particularly so when you're in, in, in Bangladesh. And, yeah. and uh, there's, it, it does, every time I travel here it, or to Bangladesh, it does remind me, yes, the minute I step foot in the country, this is Bangladesh. I can smell it. It's, it's, and, and most of the time it's, uh, it's, uh, it's quite a variety that is not what you would normally encounter in the United States. So our, Complaining aside. <laughs> I, it was that complaining I was trying to be good about. Yeah. It. <laughs> oh, I brought it up. So I, I'm not singling you up by any stretch. Um, I think this trip is one of the best things that we both do. Um, the profound gratitude that I have that comes out of this trip, whether it's for everything I have in my life, whether it's for the bonds that I form with people from another culture, another country who don't speak the same language yet show such unmistakable gratitude and, um, and just are so overjoyed that people will come from all across the world to help them. The bonds that you form with these people so quickly are probably the one of them, you know, probably the most fulfilling thing that I do in my life. Um, I don't, I mean, you feel that way too? And as doctors and listen, let's face it, we do aesthetic surgery as our job at this point, we impact patients' lives for the better. We want patients to be happy, happier after we've helped them. 
But this kind of helping on this level is profoundly different. Um, when you think about a child that grows up in Bangladesh, children that would be shunned, ostracized, never made part of a normal society. And when you can actually change their life, their entire course of their life with a two hour surgery. Uh, or, at an or, age, even, or even a one hour or, surgery. Or some of them one hour. Yeah. Yeah, you're a, a faster, sur a better surgeon than I. <laughs> it might take me two. <laughs> but you're right. It's just when you, um, when you think about what, when I think about that, those people that I feel like I can make such a dramatic impact, it will, it brings meaning and it brings contrast to everything else I do. I, I enjoy what I do every day at work. I appreciate it even more when I come to a place like Bangladesh and I can help these patients. It's, it's overwhelming. It's, it's profoundly overwhelming. And I am always left with such a sense of gratitude and, and joy that we have the skills to be able to do this. Um, and, and in a week and literally a week of, of our lives every year, uh, this is the first year in a while that I've been able to do it, but, but over the years, it, it, it's kept me grounded and it's, it's made me a better person pretty much in every way. Here, here. That, I couldn't agree more. I can't wait to go back next year, but I can't wait to go home. Can't wait to see my family. Can't wait to work at Dallas Plastic Surgery Institute where everything is efficient and, um, and I don't have to worry about where the equipment is coming from. No more surgical, little surgical temper tantrums when you're uh, in the operating room and they don't have the right music playing for you. Yeah. I mean, it just makes me feel so grateful for everything, both the trip and for what I have in my own life. I want to thank all the people in Bangladesh. I would like to thank Smile Bangladesh and uh, the founder, Dr. Aziz. I would like to thank our team. This was, as Sam said, the biggest team, 22 people. Fantastic. These were all amazing surgeons, anesthesia, pack mute, um, Adrian and Caitlin were amazing, mm -hmm. uh, in recovery. Um, I will not complain about my life for at least a week after I get back. So hopefully you have a little bit of insight into what, um, Bangladesh is like for us. We thought we would talk about this, uh, while it's fresh in our head. If you would like to learn more or would like to help in any way, website is smilebangladesh.org. There's a donate section on there as well. Every little bit you can donate helps the organization and helps us take care of more children. So thank you for watching. And uh, until we see you again, take care.